Okay, um, there's a traditional um, African practice that I subscribe to in which a younger person asks an older person for permission to speak. So I'm going to ask uh, my sister Vivian Canty uh, for permission to speak, and all you need to say is yes or no. Thank you very much. Uh, it is indeed an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, 15 minutes isn't a whole lot of time to basically uh, talk about Malcolm's assassination, but you know I will you know, give it a, a good shot. What I'd like to do normally is to reconstruct the assassination of Malcolm X inside this room. So I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. And then what I want to do is I want to talk about my book. I published a book 21 years ago called Conspiracies Unraveling the Assassination of Malcolm X. And that was basically accumulation of 11 years of studying Malcolm's assassination. And what I was interested in doing was trying to resolve it, trying to figure out exactly who, in fact, was responsible for Malcolm's assassination. And what I basically uncovered uh, during my 11 years in interviewing lots of people going through every FBI file that had been released at the time that I was doing it, CIA files, uh, boss files, any files that I could basically get my hands on interviewing people. And what I basically found was that Malcolm's assassination was the result of three intertwined conspiracies. Now, I know in the United States, conspiracy is a bad word. Um, you know, as a historian, you know, through the, you know, who you know, went through the system, this, this system wants you to think that conspiracies do not exist unless you're in some damn communist country or something like that. Conspiracies historically is as American as apple pie and baseball. So what I basically found was there were three intertwined conspiracies in the assassination of Malcolm X. One was orchestrated by the Federal Bureau of Investigation under the leadership of J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> The second was orchestrated by the leadership, the national leadership of the Nation of Islam, uh, specifically Elijah Muhammad and what was generally known as the royal family, that is the leadership uh, class of the Nation of Islam, most of whom were Elijah Muhammad's uh, uh, you know, family. Um, and then the third one was the NYPD, but specifically BALSI, the Bureau of Special Services and Investigation. John mentioned him a few minutes ago. BALSI was pretty much a miniature FBI. And they basically did the same things that the uh, bigger FBI did as far as counterintelligence was concerned, as far as surveillance was concerned, as far as illegal activities designed to neutralize people. So what I basically found was that Malcolm's assassination was the result of these three forces coming together and basically uh, having a common enemy and ultimately killing Malcolm X. Now, let me set it up in this room. The day is February 21st, 1965. The time is approximately 3.08 p.m. It's a Sunday, it's cold outside. We're in New York City in the Audubon Ballroom near St. Nicholas and Broadway. Malcolm X is backstage. He is you know, waiting to speak. Benjamin Goodman is here speaking. When he finishes, he's going to introduce Malcolm to you, to the audience. <coughs> Malcolm is telling an aide backstage that something is wrong, that he should not be here, that he wasn't feeling right. He was apparently sensing that there was some negative energy inside this room, and indeed, there was some negative energy inside this room. Five Negroes, all of the members of Mosque Number 25 knew it, were inside this room, waiting their chance to kill Malcolm X. Two of them were sitting here on the corner. One's name was you know, and I, I I've been doing this for so long, it, 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 it still bothers me to know that we know the names of the people, and of these people that we're going to talk about, none of, or only one of them actually did time for Malcolm's assassination. It's amazing. One of the men sitting there, he has a 38 German Luger. His name is Leon Davis. He's about 20 years old. The person sitting uh, next to him is Talmadge Hare. He's 22 years old. 
he has a 45. About four rows behind them, there's a man by the name of Bradley, Willie Bradley. He's about 28 years old. He's packing a J.C. Higgins 12-gauge, double-barreled, sawed-off shotgun. A few rows behind him is a man by the name, we, all, we always thought his name was Will McKinley because that's the name that Hare later released, but come to find out his name appears to have been John Kidd. He's sitting there, and then behind him is a man by the name of, of um, Benjamin Thomas. Now, Benjamin Thomas is the assistant secretary of Moss number 25. He's the person who actually organized this particular team. However, Benjamin Goodman is still speaking, Malcolm is still backstage, and so the killers basically wait. Malcolm is now getting up. He leaves the altar room and he walks to the stage. Benjamin Goodman sees him and begins to wrap up his speech. He introduces Malcolm to the audience. It's about 400 of you. Uh, he calls Malcolm a shining prince. He talks about how Malcolm was willing to give his life for you. Malcolm walks toward the stage the, uh, the uh, altar, uh, they uh, pass each other. Malcolm walks to the stage, and soon after, the man sitting behind the uh, shotgun, Willa Bradley, uh, he causes a commotion. He says he accuses someone of picking his pocket. At this stage of the game, Kenley, what he basically did was he had a sock, and he had matches in it, and he lifts the sock, and it, you know, and then he throws it and it makes this sound. So some people thought it was a bomb and people are, you know, are looking, trying to figure out what's going on. Malcolm walks away from the stage a few feet and tells people basically to hold it, hold it. In fact, he says it several times. At that stage of the game, Willie Bradley with the J.C. Higgins uh, sawed off shotgun stands up. He handles it like an expert, according to the witnesses. You know, he, he shoots it from a, you know, from a crouched position, empties both barrels into Malcolm's chest, blowing a seven-inch hole. At this stage of the game, of course, pandemonium begins to break out. At this stage of the game, Davis and Hare stand up with the 45, with the 38 Luger, and basically empty their bullets into Malcolm's prone body. Of course, by then, it really doesn't matter. Now, by now, every, you know, pandemonium, everything, chaos is going on. The assassins basically start heading for the doors after that. And after all is said and done, only one of them will be captured at the scene, and that will be Talmadge Hare. Ultimately, uh, he's going to be charged with Malcolm's assassination. Now, for the next few weeks, the NYPD tells the press that they were looking for five people. And in fact, they were in fact looking for five people because there were five people in that, you know, uh, you know, you know, in that uh, murder team. <clears throat> However, after March 3rd, when they arrested the third person, a man by the name of Thomas uh, Johnson, then they closed their investigation. So basically they were just telling the whole world that the other two had pretty much, you know, gone about their business, that they were not looking for them. The Malcolm X trial, the police investigation of the trial, all of it was basically a travesty. And behind the scenes, it was the Federal Bureau of Investigation basically manipulating it almost every step of the way. Now, let me change gears real quick. Um, I want to talk about the Nation of Islam. Most of you in here know that Malcolm you know, was a member of the Nation of Islam uh, for 12 years. Uh, he was one of the major forces that made the Nation of Islam, you know, a viable, important organization. He had energy, and in fact, in many ways, there was a perfect marriage for, for almost 12 years between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm X needed Elijah Muhammad's paternalism, his wisdom, his experience, his guidance. On the other hand, Malcolm needed Elijah Muhammad's, uh, uh, excuse me, on the other hand, Elijah Muhammad needed Malcolm's youth, diligence, perseverance, his confidence. 
Together, these two men forged an extraordinary union, powerful union. But tragically, between the FBI and the royal family, this union is basically going to come tumbling down. Let me say something first about the royal family. I'm going to make this very quick. If you want to study Malcolm's assassination, you have to look at the family of Elijah Muhammad. For different reasons, most of it was personal. They had issues with Malcolm. In some ways, Malcolm was the son, or one of the sons that Elijah Muhammad never had. And so he gave Malcolm special privileges, special status you know, within the organization, but even within his personal space as well. And so what often ends up happening is there's a lot of jealousy brewing between the, the royal family and Malcolm X. And the FBI, you know, who had been studying the Nation of Islam, you know, for the last, you know, couple decades, and had been studying Malcolm since he was in prison in 1950, um, they started looking at and realizing that there was tension between Malcolm and the royal family. And so this is going to be the angle that the Bureau will basically use to go after Malcolm, the royal family. So the way that they ultimately end up doing is they have a disruption plan. And let me be real clear. The Federal Bureau of Investigation had all types of counterintelligence programs. They didn't always call their counterintelligence programs counterintelligence programs. Sometimes they just simply call it a disruption program. And this is what they basically had within, you know, you know, for the initial uh, time. It was a disruption plan. So one of the things that I was able to do, you know, through the documents was basically to, to just outline step by step how the Bureau basically was able to take two men who loved each other, who would have given their lives for each other, and basically turn them against each other using all types of counterintelligence programs, all types of activities, all types of schemes. They would do a bag jacketing. Bag jacketing was when they would basically put out the, the uh, Bureau through its informants within the Nation of Islam would basically put out a negative rumor about somebody. And this is what they were doing, which was actually quite scientific. They're listening to Malcolm's phone. They're listening to Elijah Muhammad's phone. They're listening to the family. And so what happens is when they hear a conversation in which the family, for example, might be saying something about Malcolm, and they hear Elijah Muhammad reacting to it in a negative way, then they take notes and say, Hmm, we could probably develop a scheme around that because obviously a lot of Muhammad reacted negatively. Let's exploit that. And they're going to, throughout 1963 and, 19, uh, and uh, well, yeah, throughout 1963, they're going to constantly be doing just that. And ultimately, what's going to happen is because there was, in fact, some weaknesses in the relationship, by 1963, there were, there were weaknesses in the, in, in the relationship between a lot of Muhammad and Malcolm X. And the FBI is basically going to exploit it to the maximum. Once they did that, then they're going to go to, to the next level. And that is, once Malcolm was suspended, then the goal was to get Malcolm kicked out of the nation. Once Malcolm was kicked out of the nation, then the goal was to basically create a war between Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X and the nation of Islam. And it's going to be this war that ultimately will result in the assassination of Malcolm X. So I was told I had about five minutes. Is my five minutes up? Yeah, you got about three minutes. About three more minutes? Yeah. So for the most part, you know, that's kind of like a summary. Now, a couple other things real quickly in my three minutes. <laughs> the trial that took place uh, a year after the assassination, as I said earlier, it was a, it was a travesty. Now, the bottom line was this. The five men that walked into the Autobahn on February 21st, 1965, and basically destroyed Malcolm X, all but one of them got away. So what the Bureau helps the NYPD do, and the District Attorney of New York do, is to basically frame two innocent men, who ultimately both will spend 20 years plus uh, for Malcolm's assassination. Neither one of them will actually be at the Autobahn ballroom at the time of Malcolm's assassination. I found a document in which the Bureau, the Bureau, and, and I want you to understand this real quickly. The Bureau knows that, that Butler and Johnson had nothing to do with Malcolm's assassination. How do I know this? Because I found a document 
in which the Bureau basically tells you that according to their sources, neither Johnson nor Butler was, was nowhere near the Alabama Barbaro. And yet at the same time, this, this was the same Bureau that was constantly feeding it the, the NYPD and the district attorney information that basically implicated Butler and Johnson. So these were the types of travesties that basically took place in the assassination uh, of Malcolm X. So I'm gonna basically end it there. And during the question and answer period, you know, if, if we can get more, you know, if you wanna get more detail, uh, I would certainly be, uh, be uh, happy to do that. Thank you very much.